This UCSD TV program is a presentation of University of California Television for educational and non commercial use only. Eli Pariser, he told me I'm one of the few people that pronounced it correctly on first encounter. I'm pleased to introduce you as this evening's uh, speaker. Uh, Eli is widely known as the author of literally millions of emails sent out to the members of the innovative national online political action group, moveon.org. A co-founder of MoveOn, Eli served as its executive director from 2004 through 2008 and currently serves as the president of MoveOn's Move board. Under Eli's leadership, MoveOn's membership tripled, eventually growing to five million. He uh, raised, in addition, or MoveOn raised, over 120 million in small donations to support a wide range of advocacy campaigns and political candidates. Eli comes to the Ravel Forum this, e uh, this evening as part of a book tour, and he's going to talk to us about his book, The Filter Bubble, What the Internet is Hiding from You. The book is a fascinating exploration of the mechanisms of internet personalization and its profound implications for our democratic society. Please join me in welcoming Eli Pariser. Good evening. Um, I'm going to tell two and a half stories uh, tonight. And um, they're stories that have one moral. And the moral uh, was encapsulated by a professor of technology, uh, Kranzberg. It's actually called Kranzberg's First Law. And I, I actually don't know what Kranzberg's other laws were. But his first law is very good, and uh, it's this. Technology is not good or bad, nor is it neutral. <laughs> and. Uh, I want to talk about that. I want to talk about how uh, technology shapes what we do and what we don't do, how it shapes our politics and our lives, uh, and how it's doing that in uh, both good and bad ways. Um, how, how the architecture of the internet is shaping what happens on it. Before I get to the two and a half stories, I, I, there's sort of a little, uh, you know, a little. Uh, uh, epilogue or prologue, um, which has to do with the conversation that Kranzberg was part of. And uh, he was part of a group of, of professors who realized that uh, architecture, uh, online and offline, you know, has important values embedded in it. This was kind of a conversation that was happening uh, in, the, in the 1970s and 80s. And the core story that gets told in this conversation is a story about the New York freeways. And uh, if you've ever been on or, or the, the parkways, rather, and if you've ever been on the New York, New York parkways, uh, you'll notice that they have very low bridges. There's lots of these low underpasses uh, that if you're trying to get to the beach on Long Island, uh, you know, you have to go under these low 12 foot bridges that don't let buses through and don't let trucks through. And uh, as it turns out, this isn't an accident. Actually, this was part of the design of the metropolitan area in New York. Uh, and it was something that Robert Moses, who was sort of the grand planner of the uh, metropolitan, you know, the urban uh, area, uh, did very intentionally. And he did it so that you needed a car to get to the beach. If you didn't have a car, you couldn't get to, the, to Jones Beach. And therefore, it was going to be a place for middle class families and not for poor folks who needed to ride the bus. 
And this was a deliberate arrangement of the physical characteristics of uh, you know, the place with, that had these profound political implications. It meant that certain kinds of people, in fact, were, you know, sent to, got to some areas and other kinds of people didn't. It meant that if, you know, depending on your class, you had a very different experience of what it was like to live in New York City. And what Kranzberg and the other professors uh, that, he, that he was part of a, a kind of group with realized was that the same thing is true uh, with technology. That actually, you know, the way things are designed um, can have these profound social repercussions uh, for how people use them. And in fact, that you just needed to add a little bit of friction here, uh, you know, and make something else slightly easier, and all of a sudden you saw these massive shifts in how people behave. So that's where he was coming from when he said technology is not good or bad, nor is it neutral. And again, that's sort of the, the, the moral for these two, two stories that I'm going to, going to tell tonight. So the first story is about kind of how I ended up here. Uh, because this wasn't, when I was growing up in a small town in Maine, you know, this wasn't really what I imagined. I, I uh, you know, my family was, my, my parents were teachers and, uh, it, you know, I, I, I never expected to be part of, uh, you know, or leading a, a big political organization. And uh, I, after college, I, you know, went to work at a local nonprofit. I wanted to do something that would be useful for the world, but I didn't know what that would be, as many people don't when they get right out of college. And uh, that's where I was on September 11th. And I remember, everybody remembers where they were and, uh, and how they felt. And like everyone else, I, you know, I was just horrified. And uh, in, the, in that kind of crisis, I'm just kind of a person who wants to, wants to jump in and, and, and do something. So I called my friends in New York. Thank God they were OK. Uh, I thought about going down there, but they said, mm, probably not the best idea. I called the local blood bank. They had enough blood for the moment. Uh, the president was on TV encouraging people to go shopping, and I didn't really feel like going shopping. Uh, so because I had taught myself a little bit of uh, web design, I made a little website. And the website came out of, you know, I, I was thinking about this moment. I was thinking, boy, this is one of those real big moments in history when things can go in very different directions. And you could totally imagine that this would be a moment in which the world community came together to address a common threat that would be the start of sort of a new multilateralism where um, you know, people, where countries were working together like never before. Or you could imagine that it was the starting point for something much more unilateral and um, you know, even potentially demagogic and um, you know, that, that things could get worse. And uh, you know, so I, I, I put together a little website that was calling for uh, the multilateral approach to dealing with this and sent it to 20 friends and really felt like, OK, I've, I've done something. I don't know what it'll do, but there it is. And I, I didn't check my email for the next couple of days. I didn't, you know, I was, I was doing other stuff. So the next Monday, I wake up. And I'm in my pajamas. And uh, being a geek, I, you know, the first thing I do in the morning is I sit down and check my email. And I'll never forget watching the bar on the email program start moving backwards. And it was like 50, 50 messages to download, 100 messages to download, 200 messages to download, 500, 1,000, 2,000 messages to download. And I just had no idea what was going on. And then the phone rang, and it was my friend who I'd asked to uh, host these websites for free. <laughs> and he said, Eli, you know, where are all these people coming from? The servers are crashing. And I said, I have no idea. Maybe it's, a, maybe it's an attack or something. Maybe, you know, someone's trying to take them down. 
So then I checked the database uh, on the website to see you know, how many people had signed this little petition that I had put up there. And 50,000 people had signed from 53 countries. And then the phone rang again, and it was a British voice, and it said, this is the BBC calling. We'd like to speak to the president of this website. <laughs> and I said, um, can you hold on for a minute? <laughs> And it was this crazy thing. Uh, you know, the email that I had sent to my friends, they had sent on to their friends, and so on and so forth. It had struck a chord, and it had rippled out, not just in the United States, but all around the world. I, I talked to a journalist from Romania who said that she had received the email that I had sent to my friends five different times from five different people. And over the next two weeks, about half a million people signed on to this website from 192 countries. And when it got really scary was when they started writing me these emails that said like, so Eli, what's, what's next? What are we gonna do next? <laughs> and I said, no, 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 there's been some mistake. There is no next, this was just a one-time thing. But uh, people wanted to write, you know, make phone calls, so we, we set up a tool to help them make phone calls. They wanted to write letters, so we set up a tool to help them write letters. And, um, you know, they, and, and, and during this process, I, I got in touch with Wes and Joan, who started Move On a few years before, we, and we hit it off. And that's how I ended up, uh, you know, being part of this whole world. In a lot of ways, it was a total accident. And regardless of what you think of the politics of the whole thing, there's something that I still find just kind of amazing about the fact that you know, a 20-year-old who had no money, no connections, no media coverage, no power in any traditional sense, just something to say, could reach a group of people that was half a million strong around the world and could join together with them. And that that, you know, and, and what happened actually with that international, uh, you know, constituency was that it helped to seed an organization called the VAS, which is kind of move on sister organization, which is now one of the largest citizen organiza organizations in the world. It's about 8 million members and is winning all of these campaigns all around the world in Italy uh, and in Brazil. There's this amazing sort of uh, campaign on Twitter to stop corruption that, that they won recently. Um, but so once this ball got rolling, uh, you know, even after I you know, wasn't involved with it anymore, it kept rolling, and people kept pushing for the kind of change that they believe in. So the internet, you know, and especially email as this open medium that anyone can share with anyone that costs nothing, you know, allows these profound, uh, you know, this profound ability to find people like you and to gather together and to um, make your voice heard. And that brings us to the second story because I'd argue sometimes it's much too good at that. It's much too good at connecting us just to people like us. And that's the filter bubble story. So uh, the filter bubble story starts uh, in 2008 and I was just coming out of uh, four years at Move On. And I really wanted to uh, it, you know, get out of the sort of small enclave of progressives that I knew and was, was talking to a lot. I wanted to hear what conservatives were talking about more. And so I actually kind of embarked on this months long campaign to meet and befriend conservatives and people who thought differently from me. Uh, I really wanted to hear what they were thinking. I wanted to you know, see what links they were posting. I wanted to kind of know what, what they were talking about. And I did it, you know, I, I found some, some uh, people and, I, and we became Facebook friends. And it was great until one morning I logged on to Facebook and I looked at my feed and I noticed that they weren't there. Huh, that's odd. And, uh, you know, as, as it turned out, Facebook was editing my feed without asking me about it. It was looking at who I was actually engaging with it was saying, ah, you think you want to talk to these people. You think you want to hear from them. But we know 
that actually you're clicking more on the links of people who think like you. And so we're gonna show you more of those. And just like that, the conservatives in my Facebook feed disappeared. So it's not just happening on Facebook, this is also happening at Google. And uh, you know, most people don't know this, but starting in December 4th, 2009, Google is showing different search results to each of us based on who it thinks we are. And these results actually aren't small. I, I did this experiment several times with several groups of friends. I had two people Google BP right during the, the oil spill. One person gets lots of links about the oil spill, the environmental repercussions, uh, you know, what this means for the oil industry. And then the other friend gets just investment and stock information. Nothing about the oil spill at all. And again, you know, we did this around a couple months ago when the protests in Egypt were really uh, heating up. And, uh, you know, one friend Googles Egypt and gets lots of links about the protests, about, uh, you know, what's going on there. Another friend gets literally just uh, sort of like pyramids travel guides. Nothing about the protests. It would have been a really interesting trip, I think, if he'd gone. Um, and so, you know, what this is about, essentially, is uh, that both of these companies, and many other companies also, have realized that the key to winning, to dominating the, the new web, is to provide personally relevant information. That's sort of the watchword. And all throughout Silicon Valley now, this is what people are desperately uh, you know, trying to build, is code that better gives you what is personally relevant to you. And uh, Eric Schmidt, the, the former CEO of Google, um, you know, put it, I think, pretty well, where he said, in the near future, it'll be very hard to see content that has not in some way been tailored for you. And Mark Zuckerberg, being a, a really incisive social critic, I think actually pointed out the problem with this, although he didn't intend it this way. He was actually talking to his colleagues, and uh, he was talking about what was so great about the, the Facebook newsfeed. And he said, well, um, you know, a squirrel dying in your front yard may be more relevant to your interests right now than people dying in Africa, with the implication being, so we'll show people the squirrels. And this is what I think is dangerous, that uh, you know, in this quest for machine-driven relevance, for algorithms that can provide you what is personally relevant to you, that there are lots of things that don't make it in, that we don't see, but that actually we need to see. The internet you know, increasingly is building into every website that you go to this practice of showing you what you're most likely to click, showing you the world that you want to see. But there are some problems with that. Now, you know, what's driving this is this huge explosion of information. One of the statistics that Google likes to talk about is um, that from the beginning of human language to now, if you were to take everything that everyone had ever said, every picture, every video, it would be about five exabytes of data. That's about 80 million iPods. That same amount of information was produced in the last three days. And so we need some kind of filters to help us manage this. We need some way of sorting the bits of gold out of uh, you know, this, this very quickly running stream. But the filters that we have right now uh, you know, aren't serving us very well. And where this becomes a problem is you know, we're used to getting targeted ads, we're used to getting targeted products, we're used to Amazon saying if you like this, you like that. But increasingly this is invisibly built into the content that we get as well. So this is what I call the filter bubble. And it's this unique personal universe of information that we increasingly inhabit online, 
that's been generated for us by this code that thinks it knows who we are and is trying to provide us with information that is relevant to us. And there are a bunch of problems with how this is turning out. One problem is the picture that this code has of us mostly just isn't very good. So uh, I talked to someone at a company called Hunch. And Hunch does kind of opt-in personalization. You, go to, you can go to its site and answer some fun questions, and then it'll personalize you know, different, different other websites for you. And the guy who started Hunch says, if you answer five questions, we can answer any other question for you with about an 80% likelihood of getting it right. So that's sort of the, the power of this stuff, that you really don't know, have, to, have to know a whole lot about someone in order to start making predictions that increase your likelihood of giving them something that they want to see. And the flip side of that is, no one would say that sort of five data points is a good summation of who they are or of you know, what it's like to be a human being or, or uh, a fair portrait of them. This is sort of like a portrait with five pixels. It doesn't capture um, you know, your, your image. Uh, and yet, this is sort of what these companies are using. So it's a very crude way of capturing who you are and, and, and then reflecting that back to you. The second problem is a problem that comes up in the Netflix queue a lot. So uh, how many people here are, have used Netflix? All right, yeah, lots of, so you'll all know this problem when I, when I say it. Um, so there are some movies that move very rapidly through the Netflix queue. They just sort of zip from the bottom to the top. And there are other movies that sort of linger just below the threshold uh, where they're gonna be sent out to your house. And some researchers started looking at this phenomenon, and they noticed that actually uh, you know, these break down into two very recognizable groups. So if you make a graph with you know, the, the slow movies over here and the fast movies over here, what you get is the want movies and the should movies. <laughs> so uh, the want movies are, you know, uh, Lord of the Rings, or uh, you know, the the Hangover, or you know, these these fun Hollywood entertainment. Um, it you can watch it just zip to the top of the queue. It's out to people's mailboxes. You know, it moves very fast. And the should movies, which is like uh, French cinema, uh, Holocaust films, documentaries. You know, they'll they'll just people feel like they should watch them, but just not. Tonight, maybe another time. <laughs> and what these researchers realized is that this is, there's actually this kind of battle going on. This is a, a tug of war between two competing inner selves. That there's the, it, it, you know, and, and, and in economic terms, it's called present bias. It's, it's <laughs> your, your present self, your, your current short term impulsive present self says, I just want to watch what I want to watch now. And we all also have this longer term aspirational self that wants to have watched French cinema and wants to be knowledgeable about the world. Um, and often that longer term aspirational self loses out. So the best media actually sort of helps us balance those two things. It, it gives us some information vegetables and it gives us some information dessert. You know, and it's also, it's like going on a walk with like a three-year-old, you know, you give them a snack every five minutes or whatever to keep them going. You, you know, the, the, you mix in uh, these very entertaining tidbits with, uh, you know, the 50-page article on, on whatever. Um, and what the filter bubble does is it allows you to kind of strip out just the information junk food. You get all of the empty calories, but you don't actually feed your soul. You get the stuff that you're most likely to click, but not the stuff that actually will change your life. And this is a dangerous thing. So there's also, you know, the filter bubble also poses this problem for democracy, I think, in a pretty significant way. Because 
to have a democracy and to have it work, you need to have uh, a discourse. You need to have people talking together. And you need people to be able to share each other's, you know, to get outside of their own narrow point of view and see other points of view. And that becomes very difficult if your point of view follows you around wherever you go. You know, it's like, it's, it's as if, you know, you're trying to get a different perspective and you step over here and the world turns to meet your gaze. Uh, and so it's harder to see things from a different point of view. It's harder to encounter different points of views in, in general. And that makes it very hard to have the kind of conversation that you need to have in a democracy. Not only that, but actually, these other points of view, things that you disagree with, we know the psychology of this. And we know that people feel great when they see information that affirms what they already believe. And we know that they don't feel great when they see information that contests it. And if all you're trying to do is give people a great personalized experience on your website, there's really no incentive at all to show people that stuff that makes them feel uncomfortable, makes them feel like they might be wrong, like they might not actually have the whole picture. So that stuff drops out. And not only do you not have the conversation with people who are different than you, not only do you not engage in that argument, you don't necessarily even know that that argument exists. Daniel Pat Patrick Moynihan famously said, you know, uh, we're all entitled to our own opinions, but not our own facts. <laughs> well, now we, we get our own facts. We can live in a universe that just consists of our own facts. And so, well, you know, this kind of filtering is very useful when what you're searching for is pizza. When you're searching for truth, it can be a problem because you find your own truth and not the truth. So um, the last piece of this is that it, has, it actually comes down to a question of freedom, I think, in some important ways. There's a law professor, Yochai Benkler, who wrote a famous article called Of Sirens and Amish Children. And um, the title is sort of more readable than the rest of it. It's very <laughs> dense, but I'll save you the time and summarize it for you. Uh, it's uh, the, the, the sirens essentially are a metaphor for things that you want to have the right to block your ears about and not hear. And the Amish children refer to a famous uh, Supreme Court case, which has to do with uh, whether Amish parents had the right to keep their kids out of public school to shield them from knowing about the modern world. And uh, what the Supreme Court decided in that case was that, no, you actually couldn't, uh, because it got at this very fundamental thing about freedom. It got at this question of autonomy. And, and, and Benkler, you know, takes that opportunity to, to unpack what that means. And he says basically that to be free, to be able to make your own choices, you need to know what the choices are. You need to know that you have a choice. And you need to be able to see that spectrum. And so in a very profound way, a media system that constrains what you see, constrains your sense of those choices, actually constrains your freedom. Even though you could do that thing, you don't know that it exists. You don't know that that's possible. And if that seems sort of overly abstract, just consider that when you're talking about targeted media and targeted content, there are companies that spend a lot of time trying to target specific things to specific people. And there are people who get ads, uh, you know, who, who see ads to go to some kinds of colleges and other people who don't. They don't see that that opportunity exists. There are people who get, uh, you know, certain kinds of credit offers and there are people who, who don't. And one of the interesting things as a, as a side note that I learned in the course of uh, the research for this book is that uh, banks have started looking at people's Facebook friends as a proxy for whether they're likely to pay back loans. So this is really interesting that, that you can predict actually very well 
what someone's credit rating will be based on their friend's credit ratings. And so even if I don't tell you anything <coughs> about, uh, you know, about myself, you can guess based on, based on my friends you know, how likely I am. In one way, this is, this is fine, this is good. But in another way, do we really want to live in a world in which you have to be careful about who you friend on Facebook because they might have a bad credit rating? <laughs> Doesn't seem very good. So, uh, you know, you have the, the want versus should problem. You have the, the problem of seeing other points of view. You have the problem of control. And um, lastly, you know, I think what the filter bubble suggests is that we actually have, that we understand the, the internet wrong. I grew up with this mythology around the internet that said, that the internet was this thing that allowed everyone to connect with everyone else. And that it was actually this huge shift from the pre-internet broadcast society, where there were a few gatekeepers that controlled the flows of information that decided who got to see what. The internet came along and swept them out of the way, and now everyone can see whatever they want, everyone can talk to whoever they want, it's a much more democratized medium. And what the filter bubble suggests is that mm, that's not quite the case because actually there are new gatekeepers and their code. And the code does the same thing that the editors and producers did in a broadcast society. It decides which information is important and which information isn't. It decides what you see and what you don't. Only the code doesn't have built into it the sense of kind of journalistic ethics that the uh, you know, that the editors developed over, over time. And this, I think, is sort of the crux of the problem, that uh, you know, if you go back to the Robert Moses and the architecture of information, we're building uh, you know, this sort of new space online without really learning from the best of you know, what we learned in the 20th century about what kind of information people need in order to make good decisions and to have a good society. You know, we're not actually building algorithms that feed the citizen and people. And instead, we're just set, trapping them in this little bubble where they, you know, hear themselves, where they, where they get their own views reflected back to, to themselves. It's almost like auto-propaganda. So um, that's the second story. And the half a story is half a story because it's unfinished. And it's a story about where this is all headed. And it starts with, and it, and it was best captured in a book by Tim Wu called The Master Switch. And The Master Switch uh, is, is sort of a history of what he calls information empires over the course of the 20th century. So he looks at all of these different mediums that came to us over the 20th century. Uh, the telegraph, the telephone, radio, cable TV. And uh, as it turns out, you can find the same pattern recurring over and over again, which is that this new medium comes along and people think it's amazing, it's gonna connect everyone, it's gonna democratize every, everything. You know, he found these great quotes about ham radio, right? This is a thing that's gonna connect everyone with everyone. Everyone will have a ham radio, and you can talk to someone across the world for free in real time. You know, and it'll connect us all together. It'll be great for democracy. And of course, now we have Clear Channel. And you have one company that essentially owns, you know, 90% of this medium, a huge percentage of uh, the whole radio spectrum. So this pattern has recurred over and over again. People said a lot of amazing things about the telephone when it started. And then you had AT&T. And there's this recurring pattern where a new medium develops and it really does have this destabilizing democratic potential. And then people figure out how to build a business about it and then the business consolidates control over it and then in consolidating control, the medium loses some of the things that made it so great in the first place, and then you're on to the next medium. So the reason I wrote this book is because I really don't want the internet to follow that same pattern. 
I think it would be a shame if we looked back in 10 years and we said, yeah, there were the glory days when the internet was open and anyone could do anything. You could start a website and reach millions. And now, actually, you know, there's just these few companies and they've really, they've consolidated control over it. It's not a democratic medium anymore. It's just the system for maximizing, you know, shareholder revenue. And we've got to find something else. And I, I really believe in that, you know, partly because I had this experience of connecting with a huge number of people and actually sort of feeling what it might be like to have this kind of connection. You know, but also because we actually really need we need the internet to be that thing that helps us coordinate around the big problems that we face. You know, the climate change or uh, global terrorism or poverty, these are not things that any one individual is gonna be able to solve. It's gonna require an unprecedented level of coordination from all around the world, from people from all sorts of different disciplines and all, all sorts of different points of view to be able to figure out what the solution is and to be able to kind of together pilot our way toward it. But that'll only work if we're actually all talking to each other, if we're not locked in you know, a little chamber with, with our own ideas. That'll only work if the internet actually is connecting us to new ideas and new people and new ways of thinking about things and challenging our points of view and offering us you know, a, a different way of, working, of looking at the world. So I think if, these, if, if the new gatekeepers are going to mediate that, if they're going to be in the middle of that, then we need to make sure that they, not only that they're transparent about what they're doing, that they show us when they're editing our experience of the web, and not only that they give us control so that we can you know, have a hand in, in doing that, but actually that they start to build in a bigger sense of ethics, a sense of responsibility to the, the code that they're writing. And if they're going to you know, write this code that shapes how we see the web, then we need it to include more things than this very narrow idea of relevance. We need to see more than just the squirrels in our own front yard. You know, we need to see things that are uncomfortable and that uh, are challenging. And um, you know, I like to joke that you know, the internet needs a, it was a hard slog at first, but then it changed my life button. You know, the stuff that you would never seek out necessarily, you never, it's not the most clicky stuff, but it's the stuff that actually, you know, 10 years later you remember. That's the stuff that we need these algorithms to help us see. So I'm actually an optimist. I think that, uh, it, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't have to go the way that Tim Wu said. And I think really whether it does depends on whether we all want it to, whether we demand it. Whether consume, you know, when I talk to engineers from these companies, uh, they say, well, you know, we're not seeing a lot of consumer demand for that. And I say, well, it's really hard for people to demand changes to a product that they don't know exists, which is where we are right now. You don't see this happening. You don't see how your, your, your use of the web is being shaped unless you sit down next to someone with, the same, you know, with a computer and, and look at it. But my hope is that, uh, you know, if I've been successful tonight, and, and uh, you know, if, if, if there are more of us who know about this and who care about um, making a space, you know, making sure that this new space actually does have design that reflects the right values, the values of openness and inclusiveness and democracy, that these companies will will listen, and uh, that they'll do the same thing that newspapers did in the turn of the century. You know, it's worth remembering that newspapers and, and the media also are profit-making entities. There's no particular reason to believe that they would serve, you know, or to, to expect that they would serve the public interest, and a lot of the time they don't. But there was this turning point after World War I when, uh, you know, World War I, there was a particularly uh, strong campaign of propaganda. And uh, almost every newspaper uh, participated in it, and afterwards people really started to question what that meant, that the whole flow of information to citizens was basically being dictated by someone in the government. And a, a generation of critics came up 
that pointed out, and, and Walter Lippmann was chief among them, who said, look, actually, what these newspapers are doing is incredibly important. You can't have a democracy without it. And yes, even though they're you know, businesses, we need to make sure that they are actually thinking about how to inform citizens about what's going on and not just focusing on what will sell the most copies. And that's where the journalistic ethics that uh, you know, developed came from. And it wasn't perfect, but it, but it did get us through this last almost 100 years. So I think on the web, we're back in 1915. And we need these big companies to make the shift. And to do that, we all need to know what they're doing, and we need to ask it of them. And we need to ask them to step up. Because I really do think the internet you know, can still be that thing that we all hoped it would be, that it can connect us together, that it can support a better democracy, that it can connect us not just to people who are like us, but to people who are very different from us, and that uh, you know, it can help us solve these big problems in front of us. But it won't do that if we're all stuck in a web of one. Thank you. Do parents have the right to teach their children the same religious beliefs as their own? Uh, which is, of course, I think they, they do, clearly. I mean, uh, but I think this is related to this question about the Amish children and, and sort of to what degree people can constrain uh, what other people know about and to what extent that's sort of a, a limit on, on freedom. And I think it's, you know, it's a, it's a really tricky question because you know, most beliefs actually do require some amount of screening out evidence to the contrary. There's a, a professor who I interviewed for the book, uh, Diana Mutz, who uh, works on uh, you know, sort of questions of d democratic participation. And she says that, and her conclusion is that um, sort of uh, activism and active citizenship and discourse are somewhat at odds. That, uh, you know, the more that you know about something and the more that you understand the full complexity about it, the harder it is to act. <laughs> and so there's actually this sort of weird tension where when you get too deep into the weeds and you know everything about it, you're so conflicted and so, uh, you know, your, your hands are, are, are tied. And um, clearly, you know, where we need to set this is somewhere in the, in the middle. You know, you want people to know enough to make good decisions, but you don't want them to be overwhelmed. This is sort of the challenge. Uh, and my concern with the book is essentially that, uh, you know, for essentially uh, profit-making reasons, uh, we're moving, we're drifting too far in one direction on that. We're drifting too far towards only hearing the stuff that we want to hear and not hearing the, the alternate views. We're not filtering any of these. <laughs> <laughs> See, this is, this is the problem. This is, <laughs> I need some, some algorithmic help. Um, so this is a question from Drew Spence who says, Could, couldn't you say that the success of sites like MoveOn was made possible because of the filter bubble? Because of the difficulty in creating a sticky website that survives and ranks high in Google search rankings, isn't it true that well-funded sites like MoveOn are made stronger because of this? So um, it's a good question. I think you know, the part of it that the, the dynamic that is similar is the self-sorting dynamic. It's the like grouping with like dynamic. And that definitely helps something like MoveOn. You know, where people feel stronger and more powerful. I mean, this was always the thing that in the Bush era when, uh, you know, MoveOn was sort of a, representing a minority view, uh, one of the things that people said over and over again was, I felt like I was alone, and it was so great to know that there were so many other people who felt the same way. And that's a really profound experience, and when you have that experience, it changes what you're willing to do and how you're willing to act. And so I think that's the same dynamic, not to, I mean, the, the, what happened in Egypt was far more profound and amazing, but it's the same dynamic at work, which is that there's this collective action problem. If, I, if I'm the only person who steps out, I'm going to get taken away by the police, but if there's 100,000 or a million of us, they can't lock us all away. Um, 
so that that dynamic is very profound, you know, and uh, and it's it's playing on that dynamic that I think, you know, is what drives a lot of the personalization. But clearly, you know, you also need to be introduced to things that are different from you. And and I would never suggest that people only use you know use move on as their only information source. You want to have a mix. Um, what are some of the five data points by which we are categorized by internet providers? <laughs> Um, so uh, one interesting thing, by the way, is that lying doesn't work that well uh, because what these services provide, what these services draw on is sort of a long-term uh, history of, of usage. Uh, so a lot of people say, well, can I just go on Google and like click like crazy and confuse it about who I really am, and I'll, you know, and then it'll reflect my views. But you basically have to do that for for a year. I mean, to build up the sort of to build up the the kind of record that that will work. Um, so the five data points from Hunch, I'm gonna forget all of them, but um, it was basically something that's essentially a proxy for gender. You know, so if you ask someone, do you like, do you prefer blue or pink or whatever, you know, then that counts. That'll help you. Uh, Something that's a proxy for, am I an introvert or an extrovert? Something that's a proxy for political leaning? And, um, and then a generational, you know, kind of a question of generational taste. And with those, and, and there's one more that I, I, I'll email anyone who's especially interested. Uh, the, you know, with those five data points, you can actually predict incredibly you know, with an 80% accuracy. And he, the guy who runs Hunch, Chris Dixon, actually was very sort of, was thinking a lot about these questions of, you know, sort of how is it right to use this data? And he said, actually, not only is it true that we can predict you with an 80% accuracy, but if we have two of your friends and they've completed those five questions, then even if you haven't completed them, we can actually make very accurate predictions about you. So for example, he said, you know, we could create a website that would be much better than even odds at predicting if someone was straight or gay. And he said, and we thought about it, but then we thought it would be so creepy and weird, you know, to, on the one hand, we have this data, so why shouldn't we make it, make everyone, make it available to everyone? But on the other hand, you know, what a what a problematic uh, way of going about sharing this this information that for a lot of people is a very personal uh, thing, and in that case there are significant consequences when you get it wrong. So um, it, it, the the technology is way ahead of I think sort of the social mores in this in this area, and it's worth and and one of the things that I'm still wrestling with and that I'm considering is. Is it better for these companies to know all these things about us and for us not to each know it about each other? Or is it for better actually to have these tools available to all of us? In other words, is it, you know, right now what we have is a sort of, um, it's, a, it's someone called it a oligopticon. It's a system in which a few powerful people can see everyone, but we can't necessarily see each other. And the interesting, thought question is, is that better than if it was actually all, all available to everyone? Um, the question was, what did you learn from those fake conservatives that Facebook allowed you to befriend? <laughs> um, I didn't have the experience for long enough to, to really, um, you know, to, to totally get into it. I mean, I'll be totally honest, I, you know, it's, I, I didn't have, a huge conversion moment where I was like, I've been thinking about this all wrong. What it did do was it made me think about how I listen to arguments in a different way. So what I realized was, you know, they were posting these links to right-wing blogs, and the blogs were making sort of uh, what I considered to be guilt by association arguments or kind of specious uh, claims or very unsubstantiated claims. And as I was reading it and thinking about it, I thought, oh, actually, a lot of the left-wing blogs that I like use these same rhetorical devices. And because I agree with it, I think it's kind of fun. 
Uh, but it did call attention to that at least, you know, and I, and I found that very valuable. And I did also find some right-wing blogs that I find genuinely, you know, provocative and um, useful and challenging, you know, how I think about this stuff. Okay, so here's an interesting question. What resources would you advise persuasive profiling SAAS companies, product development engineers, to read or watch in order to expand their knowledge on ethical algorithms and accurate profiling? So uh, this is this is great because this is obviously from someone who's in this in this work, um, and um, y you know I think at this point a, a lot of what needs to be done is a transplant of some of the best kind of ethical and information processing ideas from the broadcast media to this new algorithmic media. So, you know, when you look at a newspaper front page, there's clearly so much more there than even just what would be most relevant for that particular audience, you know, for that audience that the, the newspaper serves. And there's stuff that is there because it's important and stuff that's there because uh, the newspaper wants to give kind of a full sense of what's happening in the world. You know, there's a, there's a sort of representativeness value that the newspaper includes. Um, and sometimes there's a sort of seeing both sides of something value. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's just a, a lot of different uh, values that are sort of packed into this one uh, front page. And uh, right now, the algorithms that we have are very unsophisticated in that way. They're not looking at all of these different variables. Um, that's all sort of at an abstract level. So, so to abstractly, I would say, you know, learning about 20th century journalism without a sneer, which you know I certainly have had at times. I, I you know was as a, as annoyed as anyone about the way that the New York Times covered the Iraq War, and um, you know, but actually taking seriously, these institutions have figured out some things about how to provide information and that we can transplant the best of that into this new code. I think that's one of the things I would do if I was an engineer. Um, more concretely, I think it really comes down to how do you build in ways for groups of people to give these signals? So Facebook has a like button, and the like button is a problematic thing in, in my view because it's, uh, you know, it's easy to like I ran a marathon, and it's hard to like more genocide in Darfur, right? And if like is the only thing that allows people to propagate information through Facebook, then you have a real problem there. Uh, and you can see this happening. Try posting something that's really important to know, but, but terrible. Um, so you could have an important button. You know, you could, you could mix in other ways for people to mark, this is something that everyone needs to know about. This is something that will feed, you know, the, the citizen and people. And I'm not saying that it should all just be important stuff either, but you could, you could have it be a mix. And, um, you know, allowing people to signal, you know, and again, going back to the, like, it was hard at first, but then it changed my life button. I mean, finding ways of, of signaling, this isn't highly clickable, but people really should take a look at it for one reason or another. I think that's one of the big challenges that, that uh, is in front of, in front of us. Um, let me find one more question here. Okay, so um, not that I'm cherry picking this or anything, but uh, the, the, the last question is, what is the most effective way for our own voice to be heard versus the filter bubble? Um, and I think it actually really does start with having people know about that this is happening. You know, it, it really is this invisible phenomenon that affects so much of what we see and don't see on the web. But you can't do anything about it. There can't be consumer demand for it or pushing these companies for change if uh, people don't know about it. And so that's, that's really why I'm here. That's, that's what the book is about. Um, I think the second thing is, uh, you know, once you kind of you understand how it works and where it's coming from, and, um, and you know, I've tried to write the book in a way that is you know, is, is 
fun in describing that. There's lots of sort of interesting details about it. But you know, once you know about that stuff, then I think you know, letting these companies know that this is important. Uh, you know, even just a simple email to the to the you know public response box there, um, I think actually can start to have an effect. And the reason is two things. One, these are companies that are incredibly dependent on their brand image. They, they really want to be seen as things that are good in the world. Facebook wants to be seen as this place where it's democratizing communication. Google you know, has do not, do not, don't be evil. Um, the second is, in my research, there was actually this huge uh, group of engineers inside these companies they really were actually animated and excited about these, these discussions. They really do want to be put on the project of figuring out how to make these algorithms give people the information that they need to know and not just the information that they're most likely to click. And the thing is that they're not being put on those projects because you know when people are making the priority decisions at the top, this one eh, it never gets quite to the top of the list. So my hope is that if we all you know, sort of push for that, uh, that we can, we can give aid from outside to the people inside who really want to be uh, working on this. And the final thing is, uh, you know, uh, if in terms of our own, your own personal experience, I do have some stuff on the website, um, which is thefilterbubble.com, which uh, you know, gives you some things that you can do to, to opt out of this tracking. It's not perfect, but you know, it's, it, 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 there actually are steps that you can take. So I really appreciate uh, everyone's time tonight. I, I uh, had a great time uh, uh, answering these questions and talking. If you want to follow on Twitter, it's Eli Pariser. And I look forward to continuing the conversation with you all there. Great. Cool. Thanks. <laughs>